will be some images from the Mariupol siege. Uh, they're going to be just circling around. Um, there will be some graphic images, so I'm sorry for that. Just cover. If, but we, if we're talking about war, I just want to uh, just want to underline the gravity of things we're talking about. It's always uh, it's one of the problems of a, of a modern media. Um, they don't, not everyone wants to show their their, their 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 real, very very tough, hard suffering because they save the viewer. But I think we 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 need to do that. So you want you want to yeah, start? Off. Let's kick off. Yeah, that's behind ten o'clock. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this session about Ukraine. Um, it has been a big topic, Ukraine, obviously here in Davos, and uh, and I think it is uh, really important to do this session. Because the press is playing a very important role uh, about what is happening there, bringing us the news, um, and without journalists risking their lives wouldn't know exactly what's happening happening over there. So this session is called Reporting from the Front Lines. And uh, we have the chance to have uh, Mr. Slavciano from uh, Associated Press uh, and Sasha Valkolina. Better. Uh, Valkolina, who's the business editor from Euronews. Um, we will um, listen to their story. Um, and we will try to understand what they have they experienced, but also talk then in a second part a little bit about how important it is to have professional journalists um, in the war zones. And, and also at the end, we would like maybe to talk a little bit about what can everybody do um, to support those journalists, um, since it is crucial that uh, those atrocities are reported. So, uh, Sasha, we, we will start with you. So, 24th of February. Um, this is uh, the sad day where everything began. Um, so, what happened for you? Where, where, where are you? Also, I mean, on a logistical side, on a local side, where, where, where have you been at that time? But also, what happened, you know, in, in your mind? Um, can you share a little bit um, what was your situation, please? Thank you, Jan. Um, you might wonder why the business editor is. Oh, the, the microphone mic work. You might wonder why business editor is um, in the session about reporting from the front lines. Uh, I went to. I'm normally based in France. I'm Ukrainian, born, raised, but for the past 11 years, uh, I've been based in France, and I was on an assignment to cover political situation in Ukraine, starting from the 13th of February. I was on that final last Air France flight, Paris, Kiev, and they stopped flying. And uh, I was in Kiev. I was in the very central Kiev on the Maidan Square. Until then, was supposed to fly back on the 23rd. Didn't happen. This is an open conversation. I actually had my COVID as well, so that was like the jackpot. And uh, I stayed there, and uh, I, you know, it's. You, we, 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 we've heard those dates, remember, in the run-up before it started. You remember we heard the 16th of February, the 22nd of February. Okay, the 16th is over, the 22nd is over. What's happening? You know, there was this, and it was the evening of the 23rd when um, the tension was absolutely palpable, specifically among the journalists in Ukraine, foreign journalists, Ukrainian journalists, to have to give it to them, amazing Ukrainian colleagues who, which was the case with me, uh, I got more indications and information in the late evening on the 23rd. Uh, spent some time on the phone with my sources, spent some time on the phone with my management in the newsroom. And at 4.40 in the morning on the 24th, I got a phone call from a friend who told me it started. And this was the case when, I know Mr. Slav, I mean, that's your job and just so proud to be a colleague in somehow in a wider sense of it. Uh, I did not cover conflicts before. I did not have proper experience, proper training. And that was a practical, but a very, very important part 
for any journalist covering the war in Ukraine or any other country to be able, practically speaking, to stay as safe as possible to continue doing the job. Uh, I spent uh, the first day, th the morning, actually, the morning uh, reporting. The first sirens on Maidan went off at 7.06 in the morning. And as a, how can I say that? I did not know the sound of sirens before. Yeah, I, had, I opened the windows to be able to keep an eye on an ear on, on what's happening as I was packing or trying to, you know, on the phone with the newsroom, but then the sirens go off and I'm like, is that a siren? Is that how it sounds? And I know, you know, you guys are here in Davos from all over the world. Imagine hearing the sound of a siren in Paris, on Champs-Élysées, you know, in the very center of a European capital. Imagine it be Rome, Geneva. It's not something that we are ready to, to do. But of course, you have to react. And as a journalist, you have to work. And there is no question in this case whether to go and cover. You just go and cover. Uh, the first place, in my case, I went to was the metro station. I quickly realized that there was no bomb shelter in the building where I was staying in, and that's another problem, of course, for the people who are there. So metro, as you know, turned into, all, all across Ukraine, metro turned into the bomb shelters. And uh, it was important for me to go and see the people in the metro and to have a talk with them, to look them in the eyes and to see when did they come, what do they think, what do they fear, being a Ukrainian uh, and being there in that moment, it, you feel that, well, I felt the responsibility and the duty to talk also to the people. There were lots of foreign journalists as well who were doing an amazing job all over Ukraine. I broadcast for international audience. In my case, this is uh, more than three million households reach for Euronews. I had this luxury to go in different languages on air, but to tell, to talk to the people and to understand their mentality, being Ukrainian myself. So for me, the coverage started from the, uh, from the metro, as practical as that. And then, and then I stayed out in the sense of, I stayed in central Kiev trying to figure out how to move, where to go, how to operate, had a quick, as as quick as possible or phone briefing on how to behave as a war correspondent, which is not really, takes more than 15 minutes on the phone, you know, normally. Um, and and on, on that note, how, how obvious was it for you that you're gonna stay? Like, was it for you a question at all? You, you immediately knew you're gonna be there? There was no question. much longer? There was no yeah. question. Um, the moment I got the phone, uh, the phone call that woke me up, uh, I checked that my batteries were charged on the, on the equipment. I checked everything, I looked outside, I checked the Maidan, I checked the situation, and the first thing I did, and I, I was isolating as well with COVID. Yes. I have to tell you, you do forget about anything, any, like no COVID anymore, but I was also like, oh my God, what do I do? So the first thing I did actually was the piece to camera with the backdrop to show what was happening, and I filmed Maidan, and I mentioned that this is now like exactly 4.50 in the morning. This is the Maidan. I'm going live now. This is the piece to camera. But there was this, you know, Maidan, you did see Maidan Square. If um, this is the governmental, uh, of course, area in central Kyiv, you're super walking distance to the presidential administration, to uh, the minister, the government building, everything is there. And as Kyiv was the primary target in the early days, that was exactly that area that was the primary target. And it was extremely empty. And you have to show that emptiness because sometimes, um, of course, you said there are graphic pictures and they might be disturbing to some, but it's not because it's filmed that way. It's because this is the reality and it has to be there. It has to be seen. And sometimes the silence of the Kyiv is four or five million people the silence and absolutely empty streets, they speak as well as a story. I don't think I have ever seen that area that empty. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, Mr. Slav, you, you were in Mariupol when that uh, happened, when, when the war broke out. Um, so tell us, um, 
how how did you get there and and and, and what what did you witness when you when you were there I, I might get a little emotional so sorry yeah. this microphone doesn't seem to work can we turn it on we'll just switch yeah yes thank you i get sorry i'll get a little emotional when i speak about mariupol but this is very normal so don't, don't worry it's just a automatic response response. <clears throat> we actually arrived to Ukraine um, long before, uh, I mean, I, uh, I'm Ukrainian, so when there is a story in Ukraine, big story, I, I keep covering it. Um, so we arrived months before the war started, and I'm going to stop that for a while, and I'm going to turn it on again. Uh, months, months before, as uh, Ukraine was preparing for possible invasion, and uh, I clearly remember a resistance of uh, of people, of of, of uh, government officials, to idea that something is going to start. I remember press press people uh, around different different cities saying, "Oh, you journalists are winding up, winding up this uh, conflict. Nothing is going to happen," and so on and so forth. Even when the war started, people couldn't really believe that this is this is happening. Uh, but I went to I, I went to Kharkiv to my uh, my hometown, then I went to Donbas. And what was interesting uh, for soldiers, it was very clear already that the war is starting, and I saw a sign of a relief in in those who were in the front lines, because finally, uh, after many years of after eight years of conflict, uh, things were called their their real names. War was called war, and they finally. The, uh, they knew they can go forward, and they knew that uh, um, the world will get its attention to Ukraine, back to Ukraine. Uh, so, on 23rd, we were in Bakhmut, and uh, we were we were getting the same signals from from our sources, colleagues. Uh, that uh, Russia is preparing for invasion. Uh, so we sit around the table. It was evening. Uh, we, uh, me and two of my colleagues, we sat around the table uh, in a small cafe and um, looked at each other. And we said to each other, "Well, the the war, or probably the Third World War, is going to start tomorrow or tonight. What we're going to do? Where where do we want to be?" And uh, back then we thought that if there will be invasion, it will be uh, concentrated around Donbass. So we believe that Mariupol is going to be a central point, uh, a central target for the invasion because, uh, well, geopolitically speaking, uh, the corridor to Crimea for Russia was very important. So we said, we looked at each other and said, Mariupol, Mariupol, okay, let's go. And as we were going out from this cafe, the, the waiter asked us, will you come back? And I remember this feeling, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't answer to her. And then we were driving, it was already night, we were driving to Mariupol. It's <clears throat> around five hours drive along the front line and it was dark and we saw Ukrainian army preparing for preparing for something there were trucks with concrete blocks they were there were heavy weapons and we we had this feeling that something is going to start right now and uh, <laughs> i remember saying to my colleague you know uh, russia is usually starting war around four o'clock in the morning so we have like one hour <laughs> left until the third world war uh, no pressure and we arrived to Mariupol around yeah around 3:30, and in fact, uh, there has been uh, address uh, by Mr. Putin. And then explosions started, and then we saw all of this news coming from all all around Ukraine. We couldn't believe that actually the whole Ukraine is being invaded, not only the Donbas, not only. And yeah, we just started live cameras. We went out on the street immediately, and uh, I remember I was shocked that you know people still get on the buses, go to work, and people kept you know planting flowers. But that's what happens in the beginning of the war. Uh, we had our protocols. We went to hospitals. We went to um, to to military just to check where where was the there you go where was the uh, injured. 
But the first several days, I have to say, the first several days in Mariupol, they were relative, relatively calm. The main fight was going on in Kiev, and that is the reason why most of the journalists uh, left. Because I remember speaking to my editors, they also said, well, Mr. Slav, nothing is going on in, in Mariupol. It's relatively quiet, no, um, no civilian casualties, and Kiev was just insane, insane. Uh, it was uh, European in, in the round, in Kharkiv. And we said, no, I know something is going to happen here. We just have to wait. So paradoxically, all the journalists have left, and we just stayed, we just stayed there. I, you know, later on, I couldn't believe that we were the only three journalists international journalists left. There was another, there was another cameraman, there was another uh, movie direct, that documentary movie director. Um, I found out about his, uh, what happened to him later. Uh, he was also trying to leave Mariupol afterwards and he was captured and, and tortured and killed in Donetsk. So um, I'm gonna go to that later. We were very lucky to escape and not get caught. I'm realizing this now because, well, the same thing could happen to us. Uh, then the casualties started. Then the shelling has started. Shellings have started. First, children have died. Uh, again, we we did a lot of. I did five wars uh, in my life, so it, it it did feel like I know what's going on. I knew what's going to happen, but you just cannot get used to that. Uh, you know. One child has died. The second child has died. We concentrated our uh, our efforts around uh, uh, around hospital. We worked in, uh, and then the collapse started. Uh, then something strange happened. First of all, city got surrounded by military, so no one could escape. And then uh, there was no connection. The connections disappeared. There were one or two small spots around the city when, where you could you could catch the catch the connection, but otherwise there was nothing. And around fifth of uh, I think it was fifth or fourth of uh, March, uh, yeah March, uh, city collapsed completely. People started looting the shops. People started. Uh, Fighting each other, uh, more injured have started started coming in the in the hospitals, and people started to be aggressive to us, to each other, to military. It was, and I couldn't understand what's going on. Why suddenly this collapse has happened? So yeah, like this day, this day I'm in a hospital, and I'm just gonna tell you a small story so you know how how we operate. We are in a hospital. Also, no connection, no telephone connection. Uh, there was already little food, little energy, no electricity. So a soldier uh, and one volunteer runs into the hospital, says, people are looting the huge supermarket just next to the hospital. There are several, uh, there are several pharmacies there. We need to run there to take at least what left to bring to the hospital because the hospital was also running out of medicine. So they grab some bags and they run and I run after them against the protocol completely. Sorry, <laughs> my editor is here. <laughs> so I run after them. We run, we, uh, we run, there is some shelling, but we, you know, we're still running. And 50 meters to this, to this uh, shopping mall, the shell hits the roof of the shopping mall. We fall. Of course, my camera is off. I curse myself. <laughs> uh, I can see this huge explosion, and I know there's going to be another one. So everyone is falling on the ground. I can see people running from that supermarket. And I see the second shell hitting the building just next to me, so we crawl to we crawl to the nearby building. We hide and then we you know, try to come back to the hospital. I'm I'm very upset, but before that, I can see people still running with these computers, uh, printers, everything from that supermarket, which is insane. But I think they don't they don't really they also don't really realize what's going on. They just they just run and grab and with alcohol. Very strange, like apocalyptic picture. Uh, then the woman comes 
she's trembling and she says, my husband is injured, it's getting late, my husband is, inju is injured, he's in that building which was hit just next to me. And she said, his, his guts are open, you know, it's falling out, uh, you need to go there and, and take him. And the doctors say, we can't, we don't have cars, we, don't, we can't go, the car few is starting. So she, she's desperate, she's crying, she's, she's begging everyone. And I cannot go with her as well because there is a curfew and, you know, everyone who's outside just gets shot. Uh, so she gets the wheelchair, she runs, to, she runs to her home, she disappears and we kind of just, you know, give up on her. We, we all in shock but we, we, we can't do anything. And half an hour later she comes with her husband <laughs> on, the, on the wheelchair with uh, sheets wrapped around him. So she, she wrapped sheets so his, his internal organs will keep him in place and she carried him to the hospital and he survives. I'm just telling you how the day goes. And this is every day. You know, you cannot believe that this is going on every single day without any stopping. And then the maternity hospital happened. Uh, we were quite near to it. We were like we heard the airplane, then the airplane hit the hospital. We went up to see where where the shell hit, uh, where the you know this where the bomb hit uh, of the of the airplane, and then uh, we saw the smoke and we just uh, drove there, and that's what we saw. You know, we've, you've probably seen those images. <sighs> And then we were without without electricity. We were without uh, connection. There was one single place where you could have a connection in the city. By that time, it was uh, near near the one of the mobile towers. But you, that place was constantly bombed. So you could you had to go and kind of hide under the sta stairs just to just to cover yourself and just put the phone up. Know, hope that <laughs> uh, the, it would not be an airstrike because you know stairs would not help you against the airstrike. Uh, then we got uh, stuck in this hospital. We came back to the hospital. We got surrounded. Uh, we got surrounded there. We could only send images. Again, there was a little bit of a connection on the seventh floor, which is uh, very dangerous because shells were hitting the roof of the hospital. So seventh floor was not an ideal, ideal place. We would just split the video file in three parts, uh, ten seconds, and send. Try to send from three phones uh, for like six hours, and then the the office would assemble. These are mass graves. By the way, uh, this is a good example. Yesterday there was a, a news uh, on the Russian media, and they say they found a mass grave. Okay, this is this is very interesting. They, they claim they found a mass grave. And they say, oh, well, we found a mass grave. Uh, it was done by Ukrainian army. But what they didn't show that we showed this mass grave a couple months ago, the same place. And that mass grave is actually a mass grave with people who have brought to a hospital where we worked. And the children who have died in the hospital from the shellings are in that mass grave. And now you could see that same images, well, same place, uh, is shown by um, Russian channels with implication that those people were killed by Ukrainian military. So you could see this is a good example of what of how similar images of similar places or similar events uh, have are shown to uh, to the audience with a completely different message. So as as we keep speaking during now, during during Davos, we have a feeling that we are entering a new new era of misinformation when it's completely irrelevant uh, what, what images we show. It's completely irrelevant what materials we have. The interpretation, the fight is not for images. The fight is for interpretation of the images. Um, yeah, and then, then well, the escape is a different is a different uh, story. Thank you, Mr. Slavis. This is really very um, intense, obviously. Um, I, I will do already a little bit of a fast forward. Um, so uh, back to you, Sasha, you, you're in Kiev. Um, so how long, how long do you stay? And, and, and you know, at what point do you realize that it's time for you to, to pack? Um, I was packed within the first <laughs> five minutes since the phone call, yeah. I, I, I imagine that you were ready to go, but wh when did you take the, 
that decision and you know how how did it feel for you you know what, what did you have in your head and and to come to the conclusion it it's time to go that was not my conclusion in our job that's quite often the conclusion of your team and your editors who decide that it is time to go uh, i stayed in kiev for one week and that was the week when um, kiev uh, was surrounded there was just one way out and uh, if speaking like in general terms, when it comes to the evacuation from these things, this is such a, when it's a journalist, it's such a complex work of the team behind you. It's, you don't decide to go. It's not your decision that you decide, okay, now, you know, I think it's too dangerous or, I don't know, I have something else to do, I have to go. No, we stay and cover, we do our best. But then the moment comes when your editors are telling you, okay, it's time. And then you tell them no. Yes, and then you tell them no. And they say, no, it's time. And um, that's, the, that's the tricky part. In my case, that phone call happened a week into the war, and I had a one hour notice. Um, and I said, well, but, but wait, but are you sure? I mean, I'm f that's okay. And, you know, I kind of, I know where I am, I know where to go, I'm feeling my little bit weird comfort zone in the sense of I was in a rather secure location uh, which was uh, not uh, revealed. So I was like, but, but there are stories to do, there's things to say. Uh, when uh, millions of Ukrainians who fled the war, who left, in their cases that was the decision on instincts, you know, that's the fear and interesting th it's, it's impossible not to get emotional, that, that, that's absolutely sure. But for people who are not journalists who decided to leave Ukraine, I feel that you do not evacuate for yourself. You evacuate somebody you love. Everybody who left, they left because they took children out, they took their parents out, they took relatives, friends. This decision of, I have to get out if you are a civilian, comes not even saving yourself, but saving somebody you love. In our case, it's in, for journalists, it's a bit different. We stay, we cover, we do our best, but then the moment comes when uh, the team uh, behind us, the team in the newsroom, in the offices, they cannot be, well, you can correct me, of course, but they cannot be 100% certain and sure that this road is okay, but they can say that this evacuation itinerary and this way to take you out is for the moment the safer than it, what we saw the past couple of days. So we ha And this is when they come up with very detailed and careful plans which you follow by meters practically because you can't really decide to take, you know, it, it's, a, it's a complex operation and you have a team of people working on it for days and then they decide, okay, that's it because it might all evolve and develop in a different way. So this is some some sort of a window of opportunity. Uh, so that was my um, that was my case. It took me three days of drive uh, from Kiev to cross the border, the European border, and um, the drive itself was also another experience and trying to do the job when you know. There are also rules uh, for security of Ukrainian forces filming when it comes to filming, obviously, and we try to respect it. But this way as well, 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 that's the thing, you know, like you're there. Okay, I'm on the move already. I'm being evacuated, but I'm still here and there is still story in front of me and I can still do that story. I can still document that. I can still tell as much as I can as long as, as, long as I can do it, as long as I'm in Ukraine. For this story, I have to... So I stayed one week, three days of traveling to the border, and then two more days, and five days generally to come back from Kiev to France. Mrs. Lafieu, so you were in Mariupol. For you, the, the situation got difficult. Um, so how, how did, and did you decide together, for you also, you have to get out of there, and did you have a plan? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, editors, uh, um, uh, which I was speaking to, and they were concerned about our security, especially after after the wide, uh, widespread um, 
attack uh, on us as a journalist, uh, information attack, exposing our names and uh, uh, blaming us for for lying, for showing uh, un unrealistic, unrealistic images. So we knew that uh, we knew that there has been a campaign against uh, Associated Press, against uh, us personally, uh, and we were just waiting for the opportunity to leave. But then again, we uh, we got stuck in this hospital. Uh, we got surrounded at some point. You could see the this is evacuation. Uh, it's a, at one day we just find uh, find us ourselves to be surrounded by Russian forces, and then uh, police broke us out. Uh, we were just running through the through the battlefield, um, hiding, and uh, we were able to escape. But we had to leave our car behind. Uh, so we found ourselves in the last days before before we left the city. We found ourselves just without a car. Which is very hard to to cover the war without move, without being able to move freely. And by that time, Mariupol was shelled so frequently that the airstrike was happening every five minutes. You could just hear a airplanes all the time. So actually, going out, even going out from a basement, was a challenge. You could you have to kind of force yourself to suppress the fear, run out, do what you can, and run back. That's so uh, while we were waiting for uh, solutions to evacuate, to try to find a different car, we were filming. Uh, and that was uh, also quite intense because there was already no, uh, I mean, a couple, ho uh, just one hospital was working and, and people were just lying on the streets dead. But we managed to we managed to agree with the local family to evacuate. So we, we went out with them, and we were very lucky. There was just first days of evacuation when things got messy. Civilians were just running ra running out, uh, just driving uh, hundreds, thousands of cars. So uh, we got through 15, 15 checkpoints, fifteen Russian checkpoints unnoticed. Um, we were just hiding our materials uh, where we could. Uh, you know, our producer was, uh, we, we always tell that story, we, our producer was hiding a micro SD card with important material in tampon. So, you know, we, we did what we could. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, we got through. And the, the, day after, the day after, we knew that uh, the Mariupol uh, theater, uh, drama theater got bombed. So uh, we were very conflicted. We felt guilty that we were not there because we knew people there. We knew that drama theater, and uh, we regretted we couldn't be there. But we also realized that next days when people were leaving, they were thoroughly checked on every checkpoint. Men were undressed, uh, and uh, all the telephone numbers, all the telephones, all the all the computers were checked. So we were very lucky to to get out. Thank you, Mr. Saf. Um, we are already running out of time, and obviously we could spend much more time. Um, but I think uh, I wanted to quickly still take the time to talk about what I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so what do you think needs to happen to protect journalists better in war zones? And what, what can all of us do to make that happen? Oh, so many things to do. <laughs> I mean, the, the the whole misinformation thing. I think uh, it, it will be very hard to fight the, the new reality. Uh, we we can't try, and the way to do it is to to rely again. Uh, I remember conversations around around newsrooms. Uh, we we had the impression several years ago that our our profession becomes irrelevant slowly because there are so many people with phones. They're all filming, and you know, you they are probably always there before you. Uh, but then when misinformation started to be a, a it always was an issue but it's when it started to be an issue which started wars which made the start of war possible then we understood we again slowly we understood that actually the journalism by trusted journalists by by trusted sources by uh, uh, based on facts uh, is 
becoming again uh, very important because people just don't know who to trust. Uh, so uh, this, it's you know, I'm just thinking what would happen, what would what would be if there was no one in Mariupol, if we would be evacuated, if we, if we would we evacuate uh, immediately. So uh, someone trustworthy has to be there, and and that brings me to a point when well, actually we have to kind of pr protect, protect, uh, uh, or at least be sure that all of the sides of the conflict follow similar accepted norms against the journalists. So these anti-journalist campaigns should should stop and journalists should work. I mean, this is, again, this is utopia. Of course, in a war, there will always be, will be a danger to the life of the journalist. There are probably like one journalist per three days dying right now in, in Ukraine. Um, around 30 journalists have already died. So, but at least we have to make sure that, that there are some standards followed by all sides of the conflict, which will give a chance to to a journalist to to work without uh, fear of being arrested and placed into jail, a, a fear of that a wire is going to be attached to his body parts, and uh, you know he will be put on camera and recorded. Um, that everything I did is not true, you know, or uh, my apologies to someone. We just, I just want to be, I know this is almost impossible, but I, I dream that someday this is gonna happen, you know, that we're gonna have this, uh, like a Red Cross maybe, or I don't know, OSC. Anyway, we're looking out. Sasha. No, uh, whoever can help do something about it, please do, I mean, that's, the other thing, um, as Mr. Sav said, it's of course there is the war, and is any conflict zone there could be casualties, and we understand that these casualties could also be among the media. But what we are seeing here as well, and as um, is that journalists are specifically targeted. That's that's another extreme of the whole situation. We're not talking about the casualty of somebody doing the job on assignment, filming, you know, doing the job, and it happens next. No, we're talking about journalists being specifically targeted. Their f names are being on the list and being spread, their photos, their details. Of course it's utopia, and of course this is the perfect world when journalists are allowed to do their job, but I mean, if we don't, you know, it's these little things, if we don't kind of at least keep raising that and keep doing at least small steps towards that, that utopia would never be here, as much as possibly realistic. That's what can we all do? Of course, there are organizations, and they can do that. The journalists will just keep doing their job. Uh, the editors will keep doing their job. We will be doing our best. But also, these pictures that uh, that you're seeing now, um, I know they're disturbing. I know you might find it very emotional. But you, I believe we have to see them. Because when you see this, and I know how it works, this is, uh, I mean, this is obviously the footage, but I know there's even worse. Whatever is happening now in Mariupol is not filmed, and in other places as well. Watch this. Acknowledge the, re as, as audience, you know, as people we work for as well, acknowledge the reality and the importance of showing this reality. Because this may be, maybe I'm being very, too optimistic, so, but this will also help build this pressure to ultimately improve the situation for journalists to cover, to be able to, to give the really reliable fact-checked information. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Slav and Sasha, uh, uh, for you know sharing this, I can imagine, difficult uh, experience. and. Um, I mean, thank you for your courage, and thank you for sharing this sometimes very, uh, as you said, disturbing images, um, and for bringing them out to the world. It's so important. So um, I hope that maybe in, in January to see you again, and hopefully in the situation has changed. You can only hope if that. War, if the war stops, yeah. So thanks for the audience. Thank, thank you again for, for doing that. And uh, yeah, see you in January again. Thank you. Thank you.